Okay, let me share the session. So this session is about um, some of the, when we design the REST API, we should be uh, following some of the naming convention and some of the good practices when designing that. It is This session is not about how to implement REST API. I think we know about how to implement that using different frameworks, right? So basically, the topics we're going to cover is basically why the API is, what is REST, what is JSON. When we design, what are the things we need, can keep in mind? And uh, other topics that are related to the REST APIs. So what is the APIs? APIs, as we know, application programmers interfaces. So basically, it's nothing but if you wanted to interact with the applications, they give you a programmer interface. It is basically created for the developer who are the consumers of the application APIs, right? And uh, it has been wholly adopted and it is also very much scalable when we are thinking about integrating system with Hunan application or platform with another platform. So every application nowadays has a one or more kind of API, be it REST API, be it SOAP API for the past, or be it currently GraphQL API, or gRPC API, or APIs which are like supporting web sockets, etc. Now, when you're talking about REST API, what is this? So REST API is basically nothing but So does anybody know uh, what is REST full form? It's a representational state transfer. Okay. Application programming interface. Yeah, so what is representation state? Whose state it is does rep uh, represent? Right. So REST API is not, uh, implementation dependent it's a generic concept that you can implement using many programming languages or this so you represent the state of a particular application okay and also that apis when you design this api we also have to keep in mind that what is the latency of our apis right and also we need to secure that API and also we need to encapsulate this API using different domain or data objects, right? And obviously REST API, we can share the data in XML also, we can share the data in text also, but mostly we share the data in a JSON format. Okay, so which is because it's more readable you can get a nested structure, you can represent array, you can represent date, time, you can represent single attribute, multiple value attribute, or you can represent the object relationship between one and another with JSON. And it is very much flexible. If you want, you can have the JSON structure as you like, or you can also you know, make it more rigid by following a JSON schema. So that defines the what kind of elements can be there, what may be their data type, etc. And it can be easily readable and it can be also consumable by the JavaScript library or client library or any kind of library that is there across the different programming languages who are basically client. So REST plus JSON is what is the format to work on. Then also there is another concept uh, just like rest we say we say representational state okay and the state is transferred by the json document object those we are written right now here how are we going to be representing the application state there is another concept that is known as ATOs or hypermedia as the engine of application state so how the HTOs is, uh, along with the REST API, we can use this. We can use to represent the state of the application, application collections, or 
particular instance object that we can represent out. So let's take an example. So here we have a domain where you have applications. Now this application has different accounts and accounts are being grouped into different groups and uh, this application has multiple directories and there may be association between those groups or between those accounts and also application to support different workflows. Now how we can define this like so now in my application domain there are like six data object or application state that I wanted to represent. So how can I represent this using REST API? Let's see. So these are basically known as resources. So application, directory, account, group, associate, and worker can be represented as resources. So how are you going to be naming them? So when you're going to naming the resources, I'm going to be using now, I can use accounts, directories, groups, associations, etc. Okay. And, and when I'm defining the APIs, how are going to define the API in which level? Should these all the operations should be represented under each object? Or they will be defined more on the higher level, on the resource level? Okay. And this is basically REST is also an architectural style. How are we going to be architecting that particular use case or particular APIs that is there? So we're not going to be drilled down too much into the each of the functionality. Rather than we're going to be staying on the resource level, if you will, for us gain a high level view of this particular state of the application. That is divided for this sample is six domains. Now, how are you going to be naming the resources? We see this kind of example, right? Get account, create directory, update group, or verify account email address. Out of there, they are also naming not nouns rather than the actions or the verbs, right? Like here, verifying the account email address. That's the operation, right? So we need to represent noun, not verbs, right? So in that case, how can I name this? They can be named like this. Create account, get all account, search account, create directory, create LDAP directory, create group, update group, group name, group by directory, search group by name, verify account email address, verify account email address by token. This is more look like we are using RPC rather than the rest. So these are all verbs, not nouns. So instead of doing this, we need to name the resources. Now, how we can represent the resources? There are two kinds of resource representation. Either we're going to represent a single resource or we're going to represent the group of resources. For example, one single account or multiple accounts. Right. So in that case, our collection resources can be named as a applications. Right. So here we can see rather than calling get application or anything, we basically name this resource as application. Then we got to be adding operation to it. If I wanted to represent a single application, we know that after the application. We have to represent the uniquely identifiable URL. We create that. That is the ID of that particular application. Now the actions are, as we know, is represented by different HTTP, which are represent the verbs. It's to be methods: get, put, post, delete, and hit. And there is also a, like option, patch, etc. Trace. Others are also there. We know that that normally what we do is we create post to create map, get to read, 
put to update and delete to delete operation or remove operation. So this behavior doesn't need to be mapped one to one. Okay. So obviously we know that gate for read, delete for delete, head for headers only without the body. But put and post can be used alternatively both for create as well as for the update. So I can also use post for update and also use post for create. Similarly, I can use the put for create as well as for update. So examples of that is basically uh, like here. So basically, if I wanted to use put for create, I put a particular application. And if the client today's identifier, if the client know the identifier, what the identifier should be, they can pass by uniquely identifying that particular object. So here, we can use put for create, provided the identifier is known by the client. Put for replacement that we know that we can replace all those properties that we pass from the body they will be replaced as it is so that will be like an existing id now also we need to keep in mind there is also patch is there so patch and put there's a difference between these two what is the difference between these two is very simple one is put you are doing a full replacement but for patch we are doing a partial replacement only the Pass fields will be generally as architecture style should be replaced. Now, put is add important. So, can anybody explain what is this add importancy mean? Add important means that it's not dependent on each other. It's on it's on means on another component, it can work independently. Any other definition or? Any other way we wanted to explain this? Okay, I didn't it means it doesn't have any side effect on any um, anything else. Okay. Okay. Now post, if you wanted to update the post, so then we can also you know use the post as application slash the ID and then you can put the payload and then you return the 200 okay. Because here we are using update, so we are not using 201. But if you wanted to use the post as create, then we are not specifying any ID. But here we can do one more thing is that we create the object. Along with that, we can pass there what is the API path, right? What is the API path where this object is currently represented? And the status code is 201. Now, post we can also use for update, just like the previous example, just uh, on a single instance. Post is not item put. It has a side effect or impact. Or if you wanted to passing or making the same call again and again, it will not result in a single uh, operation right so if you pass in post and if you are using for create then what happen is it basically creates every time a new object but for put if you call it multiple time it's not going to create a new object it's only going to update the existing object that is there okay so post has a side effect and every time call will create a new set of options, but not for food. So we know the media type, right? So media type is two part. One is format specification and the parsing tool. So format specification is what? Your application, then we see JSON, CSV, then you have other thing, right? And where we pass this uh, format specification, we all know that accept data, we pass that, what kind of format the client wanted to get the response back. And when you are returning the response, you say what is the content type of the response in the header that we all know. Now, when you are going to be designing a particular APIs, 
how are you going to be designing that? So how are we going to name that? Will you be name that as a api.foo.com or www.foo.com.dev.services.api.rest or https api.foo.com, whatever. So in that case, this is preferable to design the base URL as per the operation that is api.foo.com and then you can have any kind of services underneath that and they can have their own sub operations or sub context resources also for example say i have like a different department or different operation for example i wanted to do a financial uh, wire transfer between two accounts so there may be a customer or customer details are available in some team right so team can have like a team url then they can have like a particular service url and then the within that the particular resource part so instead of having like dev or etc we can have the dev and other things can be also be represented api dev or api.dev or api.test and then can you can have like a sub teams and then sub service and within that you can have like a path URL. okay that can be used by the rest apis or that can be directly called by the browser client now how are you going to be designing the versioning so versioning we normally can put what is versioning why the versioning is important because uh, to keep when you design a particular api right the api based on the requirement can't get changed over a period of time that means but we can have only one resource right now that particular resource requirement get changed obviously you have you cannot map the both so obviously that being changed what happens is your logic also get changed the implementation logic of that particular rest api get changed so if you have like a client which are depending on the first version of that particular implementation logic that you call in by the rest api and you have a new client that going to be using the newer version of that particular api so how we can you know version this so obviously there mostly the popular way of versioning is there are actually two or three ways we can do this either we can have the both version in the part of the same application or same service microservice right then what you can do but we can map only one url path to one of the logics right so what we do is we prefix that with a version one and we can prefix that with the version two so both the logic invocations will be appended to the url itself without changing the service url okay that one approach another approach is using the media type so when you say accept you pass that application foo.json or application then you say the version one or version two and there is also a third approach third process was okay let me have just one version of that particular code let me fork a different repository and create two microservices and i name that microservices in the url path one is version one microservice one is version two microservices so the both client can be used but the newer client will use the version two but the other client has to use the version one so that means it's about how we can manage the backward compatibility so your unless you deprecate your api version so api versions also helps you to over a period of time deprecate a certain logic right so that when you deprecate a certain logic you can remove from their code base the version 2 or you can shut down the version 2 uh, microservices right and you ask your client to update to the new version version 1 to version 2 so that you can deprecate and you give a certain period of time for the customer to switch over or the clients to switch over to the newer version 
okay so whichever approach you choose you need to version your api whenever there is any change so always add a version one to your api as required and if there is a modification you can obviously change to version two version three etc okay um okay so we have seen that we can pass that resource format also so resource format what kind of content type that we are sending that we can mention and also we can mention in addition to the application suggestion or something we can have different content type. for example i'm downloading a csv file right so that will have the particular mime type for the particular csv document maybe i want to say this is like a uh, updated version of maybe this excel file if i am returning maybe this is like a xls format or excel format or if it is excel i can say this is supported by the office too so i can pass the, the additional parameter if required separate by semicolon and certain values okay. now when you designing this apis uh, what we basically use we use the camel cases right so this is camel case i'm going to use for properties okay why so because the json that i'm going to send across that is mostly going to be consumed uh, into your javascript and so javascript use camel cases for example if i'm returning the account and i say given name I can use this kind of like a case logic, which is C in Python, like given underscore name or something. But as it is going to be consumed into the JavaScript, it's better to give in a camel case format, like given name. Okay. So these are because mostly it's not compatible with the JavaScript, which are primarily consumer of my REST API. Okay, and this is we specifically talking about not for the URL rather than the attributes that we are returning. So, any question on the camel case for attributes or property names? No, I hope it's clear. Okay. So, how are you going to represent the date and time? So, date and time or date and timestamp can be represented in a different way. But there are different standards that you can follow. That is one standard is ISO 8601. So obviously, uh, we use uh, date and time. And obviously, date and time and timestamp, there is also the option called time zone being included. So what is the ISO 8680 time format? Date and time format is first is YYY, then you're having like month, MM then dd then there is a d which separate the time portion then you hh hour in 24 hours option uh, format then you have second uh, minute and then second then microsecond and the time generally should be represented in the utc or in each mean time and that can be so we are not going to be adding any kind of time zone offset out here Rather, we represent the data and UTC. Is the application responsibility or the consuming time responsibility to convert it into the customer time zone format? Okay. So always, when you're representing date, time, timestamp, use the ISO 8601 date and time or timestamp format that is there. Okay, what about response budget? Okay. So uh, generally in post, if we use for the create option, right? Uh, we can return the new object as required. So previous example, we have seen that we are returning the URL to which that object can be written. So include your response body whenever it is possible. Um, maybe for header it is not required to provide the body 
maybe also for delete it is not make sense to provide the body because that particular object state currently do not present or not asked by the client also and uh, we can also have an operation override using a query parameter that whether the client want a body or not okay but general rule of thumb is that you should be returning the body as much as possible minus the hit and the delete and even if the gate post proof etc you are returning the body you can also give the client the option to control to whether to get the body or not to have that particular body so this is um, we have provided right accept header we know so in the accept header i can also pass multiple representation that the client can understand client will pass those in the format in the order of preference so it may return the data in application.json or text.play so if the application that json is the first preference option if it is there we should be trying to in our implementation should be returning that if not possible the other alternative format we can pass is the text or play so sometimes what i see if we, if the client is sending a certain accept uh, header for example is looking for application.xml but this application.xml is not being supported so there we get an exception the media type is not being supported etc alternatively if you are downloading any files then you can give an option okay i will be having the file in this file name either in json or csv so then the server can be accepting the files and return okay hmm. so any questions so far Okay. okay, so now we are talking about HRD. So you have seen the HTOs, right? Uh, so hypermedia way of state transfer. Okay. So what is the HRF represent? It represents the individual objects with a unique URL. So how we can represent a unique object URL by the resource name followed by the unique ID, right? Okay. So it is also critical for linking because if you wanted to link other associated object other resource object you can pass the hra for that so let's see some examples so for example we wanted to get a account 
So any question out there? Guys? No, from my friend. Oh. So for example, here we are representing an account object which is instant type, right? So here, uh, if I say href, right? So instead of also giving that particular object properties, we can include the href, and then we can give the server IP address version number, then the account URL. So this become the unique URL, canonical URL for this particular resource. So if we wanted to access this resource by the client, that kind of a reference or self-reference we can include into our code as well. Now, resource reference or linking is hypermedia or the link is there. So this is uh, not, uh, it is difficult to put into JSON, right? Linking will help you to, you know, access other resources because the client uh, don't need to build the URL again and again. We need to access other related resources as required. And in XML, there is like a XLink is provided, but in JSON, we don't have. It. So how we can represent that linking or resource reference? As you have seen the first uh, linking that is there, this is representing the object. Now this object account is linked under a particular date. Okay. So how are we going to represent the date? We can represent the directory using its own href. So from the account, if I wanted to access the directory, so what we generally put, basically we put the directory ID out here or we pass the directory object. Instead of doing that, we can pass the representative URL, href, and then based on that particular href, we're going to get the whole directory object as a reference. So here we link the two things. One is account, another is your directory now what if there is like collections right so previous one what you see is a directory is a unique object right directory is then the particular id so it's a single instance resource right so now collection representation so this account is belong to certain groups right maybe one group or it may be multiple groups so in that case what happened you know groups you pass account, account ID, and then you pass the particular groups. So by using this particular unique URL, if the client make a call, it gets the, all the groups this account is currently belong to. That is the collection reference that we can represent. This is a single, so that's why the name is directory. Here you have multiple, so that's why the representative parameter attribute property is groups. Now that's how you can link that. Now comes about errors. So normally what happens when you wanted to represent the error? It either represented by 500, but the 500 error status code doesn't mean much detail to the customer, right? Or the client for that matter, and the consumer of the application API. So we need to put descriptive error from, obviously in our case, what happened is, there is some exception when it occurs, apart from the security issues, right? Some of the exceptions that are handled by the framework, for example, if we are making, say, a particular, we are asking for a particular content type or format media type for the content type that is not supported by the server. Then the framework itself going to throw an error, so this is not being supported. And they can give the error detail there. Well, in our case, for example, there is any exception occurs, either a business rule get failed, okay, it's a 400 bad request, or it has a 500 internal server errors, or it has a, any other kind of a, like a constraint violations, or anything that is not being supported, okay, that is a 400 group of errors, if it throws, then you also need to see, apart from the status, Error type, we need to say why that error is being caused and what information we can pass to the content to say or the consumer to say that why this error is there. Because end of the day, this API has been consumed by the developer. So as much as information you can provide, your APIs will be 
better understood and those uh, issues they can then rectify. For example, in a directory I wanted to update and both of the directories are in multiple requests has been there and the directory was wanted to be created that is already present. So here we are returning the status code is 409, right? So it is basically the client problem that it's already wanted to create that particular object. So apart from that, only just sending the HTTP status code, the actual status code is also represented within the body. Okay. So here, what you normally find that every application wanted to create its own group of error code mapping. Okay. And here the validation has been failed based on the name because the duplicate name has been found from the database, right? So here you can say for which property the validation has been failed, one property, or many property, what may be the message. If there is multiple property failed, what is the cause of individual failure that you can represent? So here it says the directory name that is already exist. Okay. So now it also gives you the more information if they having any kind of a documentation of their own error status code that can be also be included and also be detailed error message can be provided for the developers right that how can you know represent errors now yeah i have one doubt uh, what is the difference between status and code here yeah status status is nothing but its status it's http status we also included the status in the header as well. It means a conflict. 409 means a conflict. Let's say that, okay, this particular object is already to exist. You cannot create that object, right? So for example, I wanted to create an object and it violates the database constraints, right? Unique constraint. So that result in a conflict, right? Now code is basically nothing but a standard code that you define for each scenario. For example, say I'm doing a payment processing. Now what may happen? My credit card that I'm used to make the payment, maybe that is not validated by the bank. Okay. So I can throw an exception. Or maybe I'm applying for a creating enroll into a particular course but i have already enrolled into the course so there will be a particular specific status code that is there and these status codes can be grouped together by the domain or by the validation rules so it's the application specific status code it is uh, not some http status code so this is basically application status code, which gives you more detail why that error has happened. Because by looking into the 409, one cannot understand why the error has happened, right? And these status codes are basically different for different applications. So the code we can define in our uh, in our code, right? In our logic functionality. Right. And the status code, uh, it is the standard HTTP status. Right, 200 and 500, like that. Right, okay, okay. Now, apart from this, we need to secure our APIs. So, what are the do don'ts for this? Obviously, uh, we should be avoiding using sessions, making our APIs stateless, right. We rather use a backend uh, state storage mechanism, either it's uh, permanent storage or maybe in memory storage, whatever may be the case for our based on our requirement. And every request needs to be authenticated, right? User need to authenticate itself before it can make a call. And also, when you are making the APIs, right? Another important point of the security is uh, is the permissions right so only the authorized person who has the permission should be able to access that particular resource for example uh, as per our this application 
there is a only account, right? So only the account holder can view what are the groups that person is belongs to, unless until there is like a administrator who has given a permission to view any group of users accounts, right? So that we also need to be keep in mind. Okay. Next, the authorizations are based on resource contained, not on URL, right? So we can use the existing protocols that are there. Okay. So obviously they will be having like uh, SSL. Every request should be behind HTTPS and they should be follow the TLS certificate 1.2. That is a prevalent certificate. Should not use the older version of it. And uh, there are basically two kind of OAuth specific or open ID based connection that you can create. And like I'm saying, creating your custom authentication schema, you can create that. And if you are providing your know, client port or SDK, for example, for example, I wanted to use any AWS services. So AWS provide me the SDK. And then there in the SDK, if I wanted to make a call, I wanted to send up my AWS credentials beforehand. So that are basically the calls that have been made either by the SDK or CLI tool, AWS CLI tool, everything is using a REST API at the back end. So those are secure by their mechanism, right? And generally, it is not uh, very much advisable to using username and password for authentication of API. Rather than you can have an API keys that you can use for authenticating the user. When you use the API key, what happens is, I'm coming to the API key first. API keys can be managed separately, right? And they can be also be limited exposure. It is only been given or generated for a particular application. And the API keys are not shared across the all the application, right? And they can be password reset. So the administrative portal can also be have or administrative account can be have which can regenerate the particular API based on that particular password they have, right? And they are basically independent and this is a much more speedier approach to do this. And it also gives you a traceability like, against that API endpoint, who is the client is associated, how much APIs they are consuming, are they are going beyond their quota, should we need to add rate limiting or Hotling on their API request. So that kind of monitoring or metering you can also do. We know about 401 and 403, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, there are like separate authentication scheme we can also pass. Generally, we put a particular scheme name and we can say what is the real name, right? So server response is shared and they issue a particular challenge and the client side can also use request to submit credential. But this is like not very prevalent uh, way of securing the endpoint rather than the API key based uh, authentication scheme is mostly used. Now, all the resources we have created, right? The resources need to be identified, right? So what are you going to be choosing as my resource IDs? Sometimes we normally go for like UID or URL 64 base thing, right? Generally, it is advisable not to use sequential number, right? A sequence of the database table or a primary key sequence we should not be using. And obviously, the IDs need to be globally unique, right? So that's why the UID we can use, right? And user sh the other man in the middle should not be able to guess those IDs because those are randomly generated. Okay. 
Now, HTTP method override. For example, any kind of method that is there, its main purpose is to create or update, right? Now, I pass this particular account, and I wanted to use the underscore method to delete. So that can be also be possible, but we generally don't see much uh, as a practice to use this. So basically, if you method override means what you are having that particular method, but you wanted to you know override and use a different method altogether. But you are using the post mechanism for doing that. Okay. Cache and concurrency control, right? So concurrency control, what happened is when you wanted to two requests has come at the same time. Now, any one of them going to be updating the record into your personal store, right? So one may be updating one record that may be overriding by the another record. So how to control that? Or for example, how are we going to be controlling the cache that is either managed by the client side or managed by the browser cache? Correct. Okay. So in that case, what you can do on the server side, you can generate an e tag, right? A unique ID and represent that particular state at that particular point of time client wanted to update the same versions right so it will send on a later request on the subsequent request if none match that okay and if that server side that particular thing is been modified then it's going to be returning 304 it is not modified so and if it has been updated it will return 200 or whatever and it shows that particular thing has been updated so based on that particular information from the server side it can update the still state of that particular object in his local cache ps browser be it your application client right so that means i'm not going to be having a particular state because it's representing the state of a particular resource which is kind of outdated right so that's why the unique id has been generated to represent that particular state or the particular time point time that's known as e tag and then on the client wanted to know whether the tag has been updated or not server can return based on the current state whether the tag based representing object is do present or not so any other questions you guys have No, from my side. Okay. So we have follow these things, right? Over this. So hopefully, when we're going to be designing our API, we're going to be keeping this in mind in our current project or in future project. Okay. Fine. So if there is no more questions, then we can, you know. Close the session for now. Mm -hmm. Also, share.